Hello, welcome to the next episode of Just Peachy. I'm Peachy Thompson and I'm your host. Just Peachy is a show where I interview experts in the fields of finances, insurance, and taxes. Because this show is for the consumers, once or twice a month, we do have fun. We have a lifestyle section where I sit down with experts and talk about culture, lifestyle, and food. I have an awesome lineup of speakers that I can't wait to share with you. And today's speaker is BNC Financial Advisors Chief Investment Officer, Sean Goldie. Sean, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Peachy, thanks for having me. It's great to be here and uh, happy to participate in this wonderful podcast. Tell our viewers about yourself and your firm, please. Yeah. So um, I am one of the owners of BNC Financial Advisors. As Peachy said, I'm the chief investment officer and I'm also a certified financial planner. So our firm is an independent registered investment advisor located in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. We have a specialty in, in working with folks that are at or near retirement and then through their retirement journey. That's really the uh, the main genesis of our firm is, is focused on that side of things. That's not to say we don't help other folks and that we're not you know working with younger folks to, to help them get on that retirement picture. But by and large, the folks that we mainly deal with are in that retirement planning phase of their life. And uh, you know we've, we've been around for 25 plus years and we've really built a, a specialty in working with folks and using uh, not products and um, you know selling people on different things and getting roped into some of the, you know, the bigger firms, they have sales contests and things like that. We're just a local firm focused on serving our clients first in that fiduciary capacity. I love it. You said fiduciary capacity. So let's talk about that. Uh, as a consumer, I really don't know what the differences are between the financial advisors. There's so many people calling themselves financial advisors nowadays. Uh, so tell me your thoughts about what what a fiduciary advisor is and and what's the difference between a regular advisor and what fiduciary advisors call themselves as. Right. So I think the, the first thing to do is to define what a fiduciary is. And a fiduciary is someone who has to act in the best interest of the person they're working for. Um, so we basically, as a fiduciary advisor, have to put our, uh, ourselves in the client's shoes and operate like we are the client in, in the sense of making decisions that are for their best interest. And part of that as well is you know, outlining any conflicts of interest we might have with respect to the advice that we're providing and the services that we're, we're offering to our clients and being very upfront and, and transparent about those things. Um, there are some, you know, advisors around and, and folks in the financial business that will, um, you know, sell you a bill of goods that really doesn't ring true. Um, and, you know, what we really try to do is to be very transparent about how we operate. And um, part of that is being fee only. Uh, we don't do any commission based work. Uh, being locally owned and independently owned, we don't, um, you know, we don't have to answer to um, you know, anybody but our clients, basically. And, and, and so from a fiduciary perspective, you know, it's, it's offering them the uh, out of two options, if one's cheaper and economy, both accomplish the same goal, we're going to go with the cheaper option. Uh, and that's, that's one example of how to do that. Awesome, Sean. Okay. Um, you mentioned a few things there, being a fee only advisor, and not selling uh, products, right? So what makes a fee-only advisor really different from other advisors? Perhaps you can educate us on how advisors get paid in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, from the start in, in the, you know, financial advisory business back in the, uh, the, the battle days of uh, high commissions, fixed commissions, and that sort of thing, financial advisors used to make money by um, brokering trades, um, calling up clients and, you know, selling them pitching them the next hot stock and they'd make, you know, five or two, two to five percent on those trades. And that's how they earn their living. Each time there was a trade done, that's how they earn their money. Um, in the insurance world, again, you know, you place a you place an insurance policy or you place an annuity and you get paid up front on that or on trails and, and that sort of thing. Um, from a fee only perspective, or when you're a fee advisor, you are typically, I guess the, the historical typical way of getting paid is through assets under management. So 
Uh, when you look at a mutual fund, you'll look through the prospectus and see that they they have a, a man, what's called a management fee. There's often some other types of fees in there that are there's distribution related or, or operating related fees. But the person who's managing the money gets paid a fee as a percentage of the assets. And so uh, registered investment advisors have taken on that, that sort of model uh, to work with clients versus using commissions. And the main reason, at least for us at BNC, that we went to that route is so that we could be you know, from that fiduciary perspective, trying to sit on the same side of the table as a client and, you know, not calling them on, you know, the end of the quarter when I needed to make my number to, to get paid and saying, hey, we got to do these trades. But to say, um, we're only going to do trades when it's necessary and important to meet the mandate that we've agreed upon in our, in our investment policy statement. And we're not going to go and churn your account and do a bunch of trading that's really not helpful to your overall portfolio, but would be helpful to me if I was commission based. So um, the fee comes out of the assets under management in, in the way that we work. Um, some advisors will work on a, a project-based um, fee planning arrangement. So that would be, you know, outlining a project and, you know, hey, it's $10,000 for the year or something of that nature. Um, it, but, but really, by and large, the majority of the registered investment advisors in, in the country are working on an AUM assets under management model. Excellent. So I, I have a question about that. So when when you say that the fee could be based on on the assets the AUM right so does mm -hmm. that mean you're taking money out of my investments or can you explain that a little bit sure so you know in a typical arrangement we you know we were working with a client or with a, a family that has let's say an IRA for for the husband or IRA for the wife and maybe they have a joint account an investment account that they've you know accumulated assets in over time uh, and each of those accounts would be billed specifically for their portion of the assets that we're managing. So the typical, I'm going to say the standard industry fee would be 1%. We all know that's different and it's it's sort of coming down to a certain extent, but you know, 1% of assets under management, basically a lot of folks that we, we bill on a quarterly basis. So at the end of each quarter, you say, here's what the portfolio is worth. Here's what the account is worth multiplied by 1% divided by four. And that's the fee that would come out of the, the client's accounts. The reason for that is it's, it's simple. Um, it's pretty straightforward for the client. It's pretty easy to, to kind of handle the payment and that sort of thing. Um, but we have, you know, some, some folks want to pay with their checkbook and say, I know what I'm paying and I want to see those dollars come out. We're, we're, you know, we're pretty flexible when it comes to that. And there's some, you know, fantastic te technology that, that you can lever to, to kind of, um, you know, bill in that, in that, in that way as well. Excellent. So I know that um, I work with a lot of, of CFPs. Tell mm -hmm. me what, what CFP means in, in the financial world, please, and why would a consumer care about it? Sure. So a CFP stands for Certified Financial Planner, and the Certified Financial Planner designation was developed. I wish I could remember the history off the top of my head, but it's it's been 30 plus years that in existence, and it was really developed to sort of segment those folks that were treating being a financial advisor like a CPA. Basically, it's a designation that's supposed to be in, in, in comparison to a CPA for tax planning purposes. So someone who uh, at this time, you, you have to go through um, 18 months worth of education requirements. I think that's the total between the six different classes and the seventh capstone class. So there's an education component that's pretty strenuous, somewhat like a graduate degree. Um, and then you have to have a work experience in financial advisory, financial planning uh, in the business for up to, I think it's three years and there's some exceptions for some, some other work experience and that sort of thing. And then the, the third leg of that, that uh, experience or, or the, uh, the, of the expertise, so to speak, is that you have to pass a pretty rigorous exam, uh, which is a all day exam composed of all aspects of financial planning from tax to estate, to insurance, to investments, to retirement and all the, you know, basically from soup to nuts when it comes to being a financial advisor. And that test is, is uh, very rigorous with a pass rate that's a little north of 50%, but it's, it's, a, you know, it's a weed out. And, and it's a way to really demonstrate um, your experience and credibility in the financial advisory business and really to, to make it more of a profession uh, akin to that CPA. Thank you for, for explaining that. I know there's a lot of designations out there when it comes to financial advisors. And one of the things that's confusing is if you're, if you're a consumer and you don't know what, what these things mean and, and how 
a financial advisor actually got to that designation, it's just very difficult to weed it out. So it sounds to me that, you know, CFP is gold standard yeah, of, gold of financial standard. advisors. Well, Sean, um, I'd love to take this opportunity to pick your brain. Uh, if So I hear a lot about Bitcoin. So it's funny, um, about in 2006, my husband, you know, he, he's a computer genius, right? So he was doing something on the computer and I didn't really know what it was. And I was, I kept asking him at that time, I think we were just dating. And I said, come on, let's go out to dinner. What are you doing? And he tells me that he's mining, he's mining some stuff. This was in 2006. Anyway, fast forward, he was mining Bitcoin back in 06. So we, we have, you know, Bitcoin in our portfolio. Now, <clears throat> back then it wasn't as, um, normal i guess in fact when he was telling me that he was mining something i kind of looked at him like you're weird why are you mining something on the computer right i have no idea what he was doing so tell me uh, tell us uh, you know what your thoughts are with uh, about bitcoin or cryptocurrencies having that in as part of of an investor's portfolio right tell me well, about that first of all i'd say i hope he didn't buy any pizzas with his bitcoin back in the day <laughs> I hope he held on to it. <laughs> uh, and didn't lose the USB key or anything of, of those crazy stories that we've heard about uh, people digging through the dump looking for their old keys. Um, but in all seriousness, um, you know, every person's situation is different. So it's very hard to make a broad, you know, generalization. But I'd say in your particular circumstance, if you were an early uh, investor or, or miner and you have a significant portion of your net worth amazingly tied up in this thing that has gone to the moon and back, you know, a couple times and is now hovering somewhere around $45,000 of Bitcoin, whereas it was down below 3000. I mean, even like two years ago, um, you really have to be creative, I think, um, in looking at how that fits into your plan. And I think I would think of it in, in that terms as someone like that is a, an executive at a large publicly traded company that maybe has a large portion of their net worth tied up in that, that one particular company's stock. Um, and figuring out ways to diversify that risk. If you have heavy concentration in anything, our general, you know, preference is to to be uh, diversifiers and de-riskers in people's portfolios, especially as they get towards retirement, uh, and thinking about preserving and growing that wealth over time. Um, for the average person, I don't know at this time, you know, how much Bitcoin should or will be a part of their investment portfolio. There's more and more progress being made from. Uh, from the institutional level to provide a, um, a platform for people to have access to these things, because historically they've been very difficult to buy and sell, I'm sure, you know, or mine, if you will. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we think of it in terms of it's a very volatile asset and something that if people are interested in that we, we try to provide them some, you know, risk frameworks around how much of their net worth to tie up into something like that if they didn't already come to us with a significant exposure to it. So, you know, one or 2%, that's the rule of thumb when it comes to playing around with any, anything as far as having a trading account or something like that. That's sort of how we approach it at this time. But of course, situations change and every client's different. So that's not, you know, that's not to say that it, is, it would be the advice we'd give to any one particular person. I understand. I understand. And, and for the record, yeah, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't throw it away or, you know, he, he, he kept that part of, of whatever it was he found. <laughs> so, uh, it, so in today's interest rates environments, and you and you and I both know when it comes to investments, you have stocks, you have bonds. Should I be owning bonds um, nowadays? How, 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 what does this low interest rates environment mean to, to, to a consumer like me? So it, it's a really tough environment to be a bond investor, to be honest. I think there, there's a lot of risks in the marketplace that are, that are staring the bond markets in the face, if you will, the inflation, as you mentioned, um, and, and the low interest rate environment. Um, inflation will eat away your returns if you're a bond investor. That's, a, that's one of the biggest risks. Um, if you have 2% inflation and you buy a bond paying 2%, you're basically at zero on a real basis. And that's excluding taxes. And that, that could be another component of that. So um, it's it's been a time where we've seen a big a bigger shift in, in portfolios at large to be a little bit more aggressive uh, from the standpoint of, of having more equity exposure, more um, other asset exposure as opposed to fixed income. Um, but what I would say is 
when you look at the continuum of someone that's in a retirement phase or someone that's thinking about retirement, I think rather than thinking about the risk of inflation or the risk of uh, volatility, um, you know, the real risk to someone that's at, at a retirement age is like losing your money or having a, a, a shortfall of capital, especially in those early years. We saw that as a huge risk factor in 2008 when people were getting ready to retire. That was kind of the front end of the baby boomer generation getting to retirement age. And a lot of those folks were unprepared for um, you know, having that permanent risk loss of capital that occurs when it, when the equity markets drop and people freak out and they, they hit sell when they shouldn't. Um, and so having those bonds in your portfolio, it's not only about that stated interest rate that you're earning, but also the, the psychological and the real preservation of, of that side of the portfolio. So um, every client's different, but we definitely feel there's still a place for bonds. It's just, you know, how, you know, if you think of a, a, a levels of fixed income. I think most folks are on the low end of their targets for fixed income right now because of the interest rate environment. Um, and, and some folks are getting creative in that. And we tend to be very plain vanilla with our with our portfolios just because uh, we like to keep it simple. And so. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, the, that makes sense. That makes sense. And in fact, you know, m moving from, from bonds, perhaps to stock, it's it's almost as if now you have a higher risk you're you're moving on to a much higher risk so it really is to me it depends on on what the risk tolerance is how old you are um and and correct me if i'm wrong right it feels like if if you are nearing that retirement you do need to to make sure that you do have those investments that is, is not subject to so much volatility and also take into consideration what what you your feelings are how you feel about your financial um situation so yeah absolutely if i were a consumer and i'm just looking into getting financial advice for the first time you know younger families just starting to accumulate net worth um what are the questions i should be asking a financial advisor before i make a decision to to go with that person? Yeah, so there's a lot of different questions that, that you can ask. And it may be a, a daunting thing if you've never, you know, kind of approached someone for financial advice before. And and really what the, the most common few questions that I think we, we recommend folks would, would ask for are, what does a typical client look like for you? And what does a life, a client uh, journey look like for, for a typical client of yours? Um, so, you know, if you're a, a younger person, and you don't need all the retirement planning stuff. Maybe you don't necessarily, you know, get invested with it. You know, someone that's solely focused on retirement planning. Um, if you are a octogenarian, you're not going to go to some twenty-something advisor who's buying Bitcoin and doing meme stock trading or anything like that. I mean, there, you you have to find a a, a cultural fit. Um, so interviewing several different advisors is really one of the first things to do. Is just in general talk to a bunch of different folks. And, and questions asked is, like I said, what's the client journey look like? How do you get paid as the advisor? What can I expect to, um, you know, my my portfolio to look like? And what 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 else do you do besides managing my money? Where what other planning things are you doing? Is that a separate charge? Um, are you, you know, is there any, you know, understanding what the what their conflicts of interest are? So asking them, you know, do they get paid to refer? Do they pay for referrals? That sort of thing. Um, just because you know when you're when you're a consumer and you're coming into the situation, you're not really uh, you don't have a lot of experience, and you would really want to understand who's you know what people's motivations are and be aligned with the the person that you're working with. Those are very good thoughts, Sean, and and really good for consumers to learn and and know beforehand before they walk into that financial advisor's office. Speaking of which. How do you guys work at BNC Financial Advisors? If if I were walking into your office and I'm gonna try and see if I if I am a fit for your for your business, how do you work? So I think the first thing we do is I almost can you know equate it to you know dating where you, you kind of have that first date where you're sitting down and just trying to get to know the other person and understand who they are, um, where they come from, what their background is. And you know, kind of get a, a little bit of a general understanding of their financial picture, um, but it's it's that's the first step is just having the, those kind of introductory conversations where it's not 
We're not talking too much in the way of business. We're not talking like deep in the weeds, tax planning strategies, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it, it's really just getting to understand the person and what, what they're about. Now, subsequent to that, there's, you know, the second meeting or, or maybe part of that meeting would be some amount of data gathering and, you know, really kind of pulling in as much information as possible. Um, and, you know, that's really the next step for us is to really gather as much data and get a good holistic picture of, of our, you know, prospective clients. And then from there, we can determine whether, you know, we see a good fit because that's important for us to feel a good fit. And it's important for the client to have that second conversation where we're getting, you know, Hey, we're getting into the weeds and, and really getting to understand everything and anything about your situation. And, you know, if a client is uncomfortable or prospective clients uncomfortable sharing all the information, that may be a red flag to say, like, maybe it's not going to be a good fit. Um, and for them, you know, they're going to have those conversation points and, and uh, you know, touch points with us to understand whether we're a good fit for them. Um, and then from there, it's really about determining, you know, how they want to move forward, whether they want to move forward, and, and then really just bringing in, you know, everything together and then developing that that plan for the particular client. And that may, you know, touch various areas over different points in time. But, you know, a lot of it, you know, drives back to investments asset allocation and and for us retirement planning and, and cash flows those are important for many of our clients um, and then just you know getting them you know onboarded into into the BNC family so onboard into the BNC family that that sounds to me like an awesome thing right so what could I expect say you said okay peachy you're a target client we match right you passed mm -hmm. um, so what's my journey going to be like? Are you going to tell me what to do with my investments? Do you, do you, do I call you every month? Do we talk every quarter? Do you check my bank account? Do I need to ask permission if I need to buy a lake house? Um, <laughs> so tell me what, what, what to expect if, if I were your client. Right. So I think, you know, the, the first year or so of a client relationship when you onboard to a firm like ours is pretty intensive. There's going to be several different conversations, several, several meetings, a lot of different action items. And really what we try to do is to pull, like after we pull everything in and we kind of develop that plan and, and understand what the client's goals are and, and really kind of look at where they're at, um, is to offer, you know, the, the low hanging, take off the low hanging fruit, if you will, and cover, you know, maybe implementing an asset allocation change and, and re reallocating their investments. Cause those are sort of the, I'm not going to say it's easy, but the, the, the more simplistic things for us to handle internally, that's something we're, we're very experienced at is, is the investment implementation. Um, and then alongside of that is looking at the other legs of, of the planning process, which would, you know, maybe be understanding their estate situation, depending upon what their family dynamics are. Some people have fairly simple estate situations and there's not a lot to be done. Hey, I already have my wills. I've got a trust that's created at my death. I only have two kids. They get 50, 50. That's very, you know, plain vanilla, not a lot of complications to, Hey, we're a split family. You know, I have kids. She has kids. Oh, I have this crazy grandkid that I don't trust. I mean, the whole litany of things in that estate planning conversation, that's where we bring in experts. And, you know, from the insurance perspective, just to, you know, say, frankly, you know, working with folks like Peachy to help understand the intricacies of our clients' insurance that they bring to the table. And then looking at how, you know, alongside of a professional like Peach, Peachy, um, that we could, you know, create a better outcome for that client with whatever insurance they have and maybe kind of rejigger it to make it, uh, you know, net net better for them a client uh, from a fiduciary pr perspective. So we really try to outsource or work with partners within the, the community and our clients, some, you know, sphere of influence, so to speak, to really create that, that master plan for them to, to get to be in a, a, a better retirement planning perspective and really to get them to the happiness point where they're going to have a fulfillment in, in their, you know, retired life. Excellent. And I do want to make a point on that. And I want to make sure that it's it's very much understood that as a fee only advisor, you don't get commissions or a referral fee. If say you work with an attorney or if you work with an insurance advisor such as myself, that I don't give you money in return. Is, is that correct? That's correct. So as a fee only advisor, the, the you know, we would have to disclose if there were such an arrangement. And we don't have such arrangements and you really can't be called fee only if you're getting commissions um, for referring business. Um, 
in some instances, there are um, CPA firms or other advisors that work with CPA firms that both parties are licensed with securities regulators, and there is a fee sharing arrangement. And anything like that with any advisor should be disclosed up front and available to understand on their you know, regulatory documents. And then with each client that we engage with, we have to provide you know, an, investment, an investment policy statement and a planning, you know, agreement, you know, fee arrangement, as well as all the regulatory stuff that we file, so that there's disclosure from that perspective. And um, the SEC, who's our our regulator, has instituted a new form, Form Three of the ADV, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's really supposed to be a very plain, relatively plain English, simple to understand overview of the firm. So for anyone that, that you're interviewing from an advisory perspective, that's going to be one of the documents they'll share with you. And I encourage all of our prospective clients to read through that um, to really understand how we work and who we work with, um, because they may tell you something and then they maybe leave something out or that sort of thing. And there may be things that are left unsaid. Um, not everybody, you know, not, not, not often, but sometimes. So it's always good to read those those documents to give you an overview. And, and the SEC has worked to try to make it a little bit easier for the lay person, if you will, to, mm-hmm. to understand those relationships. Excellent, excellent. So speaking of of, of relationships, um, I've 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 talked to financial advisors who who are actually financial coaches. Can you please? kind of help us understand what the difference is between a financial coach and a mm-hmm. fee-only planner. So I, I, I can't say I know a ton about financial coaches, but I, I, I would imagine that they're not providing you investment advice and they're not regulated and they're perhaps not, not um, you know, licensed, if you will, to provide financial advice. They're providing lifestyle coaching, which is maybe encouraging you to spend less and and save more, but not in a very structured way. Um, and for us, our our main aim is to be that holistic, um, global view of your financial life. And and you know, somewhat like you know, you have a primary care physician that's sort of in, in traditional medicine supposed to kind of look through everything and kind of see the whole picture when it comes to your health. That's really what we want to be as the the advisor, the trusted advisor for our clients to look through and see. There's the estate stuff over here, the CPA, the insurance any of the other items that come into that. And then, you know, thinking about um, your lake house that you want to buy, having conversations about that, not that we're a mortgage broker that we, you know, provide real estate services, but, you know, to help you understand the impact of that real estate purchase to your financial life and what that might do to your plan. And, and it's, uh, you know, life is all about um, weighing different options and and making informed decisions about that. And our job is to really um, help people to have the best information and, and make the best choices for them. Um, in, in that capacity. Excellent, Sean. So taxes are going up. We we both know are that. Um, what should I do in response? Well, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that everybody's tax situation is different. And uh, BNC, we are not a, a tax advisor. We do know a lot about tax and we know some of the impacts for our particular clients, but we uh, you know, just as a, a, a caveat, we we always want to partner with our, our client CPAs to give them the best tax advice in conjunction with their, their investments and other items that are going on in their financial plan. Um, but as a general rule, if if you think taxes are going up, um, one of those things is to see, are you part of the, the different uh, buckets of people that it looks like they're trying to tax more? So, uh, you know, those folks that are already in the highest income tax brackets, those folks with you know million dollar salaries, high capital gains, and that sort of thing. those are the folks that it seems like are being targeted based on some of the green papers and whatnot that the administration has published. Um, but I think the other important thing to keep in mind when looking at taxes and, and evaluating planning, and and we really try to look at things from a very long term perspective, is um, you know four or five years ago uh, there were tax uh, changes that were made, and and there were people that maybe moved a lot of deck chairs around to you know, target how that tax regime was set up. But we have to remember that every every four to eight years, there's a turnover in administration. Uh, and, you know, with the Senate and the House, you know, turning over more frequently, taxes aren't forever as far as the tax law is concerned. And so you don't want to make too many crazy moves to try to implement something that may not may or may not impact you over the long term. Um, but in the short term, if rates are going up, you can do things like moving forward income for this year, realizing gains or, you know, deferring expenses and things like that, that that might play into that. But again, those those are all very situation specific. 
I, I think the first thing that folks should do is to look at who who's actually going to have a tax increase according to that plan. And and, and, and a lot of folks, um, you know, especially if you're in retirement, you're, you probably don't have as high of an income as someone who's at a working age where you're making you know, large salary. So the, ta- the tax changes may not have a big impact on that front. The capital gains changes that they proposed are a big thing. And it's really tied to a lot of the state planning uh, decisions that you can make and, and whether that estate um, tax exemption goes away or gets adjusted and, and how they treat capital gains at death. And you know, in the event that that's changed, you know, there's a lot of planning that has to go around that. And, and, you know, we look forward to kind of digging into the weeds with each of our clients on that, on that, those topics. Thank you, Sean. And, and really that, that to your point is everybody is, is different. Uh, there's not a one size fit all um, situation. Uh, even if the taxes go up for, for a certain bucket of, of people, right? It may not necessarily be applicable to the people near retire, retirement um, or, or if your income level is not targeted uh, with the proposed. And, and at this point, I really say I do have clients come to me kind of almost like in a panic, um, trying to figure out what, what they need to do and, and how, you know, in my case, how insurance could help in, with their planning. And, and I usually say... My points to that would be you know, when we are looking at that with clients and their CPAs, and that there are a few levers that we can pull pretty quickly as an advisor uh, when we're dealing with everybody's, whole, our client's holistic situation. And, and one of those things is doing Roth conversions to take more income in one particular year. And it's just moving assets from an IRA into a Roth to create more tax-free assets in the future that will help with more of that planning. Um, that's one of those practical strategies. But again, everything's situationally dependent. Um, and, and, you know, there's plenty of other topics that are that, that cross that mind, but that's one of those those easy ones that we could do at the end of the year to take a little bit more income. Yes, yes, excellent. Thank you, Sean. So, if any of our viewers want to get in touch with you or ask you any questions, how do they do that? The the, the easiest way for folks to get in touch with us is to to go to our website bncfinancial.com, and you can uh, either set up a meeting with me um, or call our phone number that's listed there or shoot, shoot, a, you know, shoot an email over to us. Um, we're very flexible in working with folks. We do it over Zoom. Uh, we do it in person over the telephone, having those initial conversations and really look forward to those in-person meetings where we can really you know, see people face to face and, and have that conversation. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Sean. I really appreciate the time you took to go over what a fee-only financial advisor is with, with us and also explain how to pick a financial advisor and, and, and just sharing your knowledge with us about some of the things that, that I ask you, such as um, other investments, cryptocurrencies, and, and what, when, why I should have bonds or, or, or um, stocks for that matter. At this time, I want to thank you so much, and I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Have a great day. Thank you very much for having me, Peachy. It was great to participate, and I look forward to uh, maybe hopping on again and answering uh, any other questions you might have. Thank you so much. Bye, Sean.